Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. We have a very esteemed special guest, the one and only Mr. Alistair McLeod, who's graciously joined us today to discuss all of the happenings in the global reset and all the financial mechanisms as he sees it from his experienced purview. Now, if you are new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow and hit that uh, customization button so you don't miss a moment of the activity. So I'm going to read the bio of Mr. McLeod before we get started with him, and it goes like this. Alistair has a long career in finance, including stockbroking, investment banking, management, and executive director responsibility for a bank. For over the past 15 years, he's been head of research for Gold Money Inc., a Toronto-listed dealer in the respective precious metals and provider of custody services. He has his own Substack channel, which you can reach him at alistairmcleod.substack.com, where he posts his own personalized articles regarding economics, precious metals, finance, and geopolitical. Mr. McLeod, thank you for being with us on the podcast. How are you doing today? Hello, John. Fine. Thank you very much. This is, this is as I said to you offline, this is quite a treat. So this is, uh, this is an honor for us. So um, Alistair, the, the first question I want to start with is kind of on a personal level to set the table so we understand you better. As I was researching you a little bit, uh, the way McLeod is spelled M-A-C-L-E-O-D, it, it generally denotes the name of, I believe, a Scottish Highland clan. I read that Dunvegan on the Isle of Skye is the oldest continuously inhabited castle in Scotland and has been the home of the chiefs of Clan MacLeod for well over 800 years. Uh, my question is, have you ever been there? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your childhood. <laughs> yes, I have been there. Um, my childhood actually was in Kenya, um, or as they say nowadays, Kenya. Um, and uh, I came to this country to go to school when I was about 13, I think. Um, and uh, so I'm a wild colonial boy, basically. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I became a stockbroker in 1970. And ever since then, I've been in, you know, in the investment management, stockbroking, banking world. Gotcha. Well, thank you for the, uh, the detail and the, the succinct, succinct nature as well. Um, the, uh, the first question I want to ask you, Alistair, on a financial level is, as you know, there was a 50 basis point for the Fed here uh, early this month, and there's another one slated to occur. I think the next Fed meeting is November 7th, just days after an election. So we'll see if that's coincidence or not. Uh, do you think that they will, rate, they will drop it another 50 basis points? What does that mean for the dollar index? And have, do you think we'll ever get to a time where the Fed will need to institute a negative interest rate policy? <laughs> I don't think that'll ever happen. Uh, the reason basically is that cuts, further cuts in interest rates from here will weaken the, um, the dollar. And uh, this is particularly noticeable in the price of gold. It, mm -hmm. Bear in mind, it's not gold rising, it's the dollar falling. And of course, where the dollar goes, all the other currencies go. But um, I think with uh, the Fed um, supposedly leading the way in interest rate cuts, the dollar is even going to fall against other currencies. And if you look at the chart of the uh, trade weighted index, I mean, you know, it's the, there's a death cross, which basically is a very, very bearish sign. Um, and uh, it's only a matter of time uh, before it goes through 100. At the moment, it's about 102 and change. When it falls through 100, um, I don't know. I mean, we could be looking at 90. We could be looking at uh, somewhere a little bit below that. So there is quite a potential for the dollar to fall. But because the dollar is the number one currency, the king rat of fiat currencies, um, you know, this is this is uh, just leading the way in terms of loss of purchasing power for all fiat currencies. And um, th there is something which I think um, uh, viewers ought to understand, and that is that while monetarists go on about, you know, the dilution of the purchasing power of money through, or currency rather, through through um, uh, the expansion of its quantity, um, uh, the, um, the fact of the matter is that with the fiat currency, it's the value which the public and particularly foreigners place on that fiat currency. Um, and, uh, you know, we're told um, that the value of the dollar depends on the faith and credit in the US government. How's the faith and credit of the US government doing with you, <laughs> Mr. Downing? Do you Not see what well, I mean? This, uh, you know, so there is this dimension, which I don't think is generally understood, and it's particularly acute among the foreigners. Now, um, 
as to your question about further cuts in interest rates, uh, I find it very hard to square that with the lack of demand for US debt, and particularly government debt, from foreign sources. Uh, Japan, the Japanese institutions are no longer buying. Um, if anything, they're probably selling because um, of the losses that they've incurred. China, for geopolitical reasons, as much as anything, is selling. And I don't think it's just geopolitical reasons. I think that um, as a central bank, the PBOC understands the death, you know, the debt trap that the dollar has got itself into. Mm -hmm. And they don't really, um, uh, you know, want to have to finance something which is effectively a busted flush. So you can see that rather than buying gold, which, of course, everybody says they've been buying gold. No, they've been selling the dollar. That's the emphasis to place upon it. So um, further cuts in interest rates, um, I find it hard to square that with um, uh, the position on the dollar. I mean, if you want to destroy the dollar, cut interest rates. Um, and I think there will come a point where this dilemma, if you like, that the Fed rarely faces is going to be a bit better understood by uh, the investing public. I agree. I completely concur with you because on our side of the equation, Alistair, and I mean with respect to our team that we have, watching it closely, it seems to us that as they continue to dilute or drop the interest rates, to, to your point, that that will make a weaker dollar. And, you know, you have, we're going to talk about the BRICS in a minute that correlates nicely to that. We believe that a lot of those countries are going to nationalize their currencies and power up and, and re actually revalue against the dollar, especially with the decline. And, and also to your point with Japan, we know that they're sort of clandestine dropping their currencies devaluing because they're buying gold. I think it's 25% uptick. So I have a question for you later on that, but we're, we're on the same mindset and wavelength, which I, I greatly, I know our audience will appreciate as well. So you mentioned sort of uh, tacitly a little bit about the banks. That was my next question. You segued nicely, which, you know, you've seen, I believe last week, Bank of America. I don't know how it's effectuated over there in Europe, but here in America it was pretty significant. We had roughly somewhere around 10,000 customers who were not able to get cash out, who had, you know, zero balances showing and seemingly that they have no money in there, which looks like a bail-in. And with what I've been reading about the bail-ins and solvency, it would seem safer to hide your money at home in a safe or turn it in for gold and silver. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. And if you think the banks are going to be able to, particularly the tier one banks, are going to be able to survive this upcoming crisis. I think the first thing we must accept is that the tier one banks will always be rescued. Um, that is going to happen. I mean, there are too many instances in history where a bank hasn't been rescued and it's led to huge, great problems and sometimes even a fairly minor bank. And this explains the actions of the Fed last year in um, arranging for the rescue of a few regional banks, which failed because they were caught unawares by the rise in interest rates. Um, so I think that's the first thing I would say, um, you know, your bank basically, um, you know, it may have glitches in the system and all the rest of it. Um, and there may indeed be a run on your bank, but I think the Fed will always come to the rescue. If it fails to do that, then there are far wider problems. Now, having said that, there is no doubt that the whole world of credit um, is really in a very uncomfortable position. Mm -hmm. um, we can see not only um, that... Um, banks are over leveraged the banking system as a whole is over leveraged really i mean if you look at um uh, the ratio of assets to equity um or core equity in particular in america it that's risen from about um six or seven times to currently around about 13 to 14 times so you can see that on an historic basis uh, us banks are um uncomfortably leveraged and therefore exposed to bad debts. I think that's the first thing. They're not actually as badly off as uh, the banks in the Eurozone or in Japan, where the leverage is closer to 20 times. And so that's been a function really of um, negative interest rates, because when the central bank puts negative interest rates on, into the system, um, the only way in which a bank can maintain its profits um, on really compressed lending margins is to increase its leverage. And of course, that is why the Japanese and the Eurozone banks are so highly leveraged. Mm -hmm. And then there is a further problem. Um, 
which um, we dismiss, but I think it's wrong to dismiss. Uh, and that is that central banks themselves are deeply into negative equity. Um, now, you can recapitalize a central bank. Um, you know, I've written about how to do it. It's actually very, very easy to do. Um, and it's it's so strikingly easy that uh, so many people listening to this will think, well, it's absolute fraud. Well, yeah, sort of. <laughs> but, it, you know, that's a simple situation. But when you get a complex situation, such as in the Eurozone, where all the national central banks are what they call key holders, in other words, shareholders in the ECB, you're talking about recapitalizing the ECB and recapitalizing the national central banks in order to recapitalize the ECB. This is a complex situation and it cannot be done quickly. And furthermore, one of the problems with recapitalizing a central bank is that in many jurisdictions, um, the parliament, if you like, uh, or the legislators, um, you know, have to be asked permission in order to do it. Um, they have to pass a law or regulations in order to do it, particularly a law. Um, so you can just imagine, say, in the Bundesbank, um, you have uh, this sort of thing, which is sort of put out into Parliament by the Bundesbank. We want to recapitalize ourselves. So we're going to need a trillion euros for that in terms of extra capital. Please, can we have permission for that? And on top of that, with our um, uh, uh, key, our key stake in uh, the ECB, we're going to need a further um, trillion for that. You know, so you can see that um, this is quite uh, a large ask, if you like. Now, um, you can just imagine that some uh, pesky lawmaker will stand up and say, "Well, hold on a minute. You're owed." Um, around about a trillion euros through target two system. Why didn't you use that? You know, so you can see how this, oh my goodness, how are we going to really, <laughs> you can see how this just disintegrates into the sort of mess, which is actually very, very hard to clear up. And I would say that that's, um, if you like, a, a real danger to the global banking system, uh, the structure of the euro system um, in the eurozone, uh, if that fails, then it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, to sort it out. So, you know, the banking system is not good, but um, basically what happens is that they will do everything they can to rescue the commercial banks, even though the Fed is in deeply in negative equity, they will find a way of doing it in conjunction with the US Treasury. The effect of that, unfortunately, is to destroy the dollar. Because, um, you know, it's, it's that is the way it's going to come. I mean, the choice is either you let um, the zombie companies in the banks go under um, and preserve the currency or you trash the currency and try and save what you can in your domestic system. Now, my right. betting is they'll do the latter rather than the former. So, you know, this is, if you like, another reason why you should look to get out of credit, because credit is not just... Uh, bank deposits. It's also the currency itself. Credit you could define as uh, being the other side of debt. And where's the, where's the debt on a currency? It's on the liability side of a central bank's balance sheet. So that is credit as much as bank credit is. Bank credit is junior, if you like, to the currency. But credit as a whole is, I think, in a very, very delicate position. And um, it makes a lot of sense, therefore, to reduce your exposure to credit as much as possible in these febrile times. No, I completely incur, concur with you. And everything I hear you saying leads extensively, Alistair, to a, a global reset, um, being an asset-backed commodities and all of its different idioms and, and away from the uh, central bank dollar, to your point. Um, a bank that we don't hear much about here in the States that I would think you would be more privy to is uh, Deutsche Bank. And uh, HSBC, do, how, where do they fall in the purview of this? Are they, we've heard for a while they're in peril. Is that still the case? Well, um, Deutsche Bank, I, I mean, they they have sorted themselves out quite a lot, um, but I, that's an ongoing process. Um, HSBC haven't been as highly leveraged as, um, uh, as, as Deutsche Bank. Um, and but HSBC is very much exposed to the Far East, along with Standard Chartered Bank, which is another uh, British bank, which is basically not doing very much in this country, but is 
listed here, as it were, regulated here, um, which is seen to be, um, if you like, uh, it, it, it means that the banks have a better rating than if they were regulated in China or, let's say, Hong Kong or Singapore or somewhere like that. So <clears throat> both those banks are very much exposed to China. So I think if you're asking about the your opinion on, um, if you're seeking an opinion on, on uh, uh, HSBC, it's really revolves about, you know, what's your opinion on China? Um, and um, I think, I think to some extent, um, the Chinese problem, we know that the, you know, the, the, the property, the residential property market is, is a disaster. We know all that. Um, we know that um, there has been a downturn in the Chinese economy. But you have to ask yourself, why is there a downturn? Well, the answer basically is that their exports and their export margins are falling. It's a combination, if you like, of um, uh, you know yet more uh, um, uh, tariffs against uh, uh, motor vehicles and things like that. But also, I think it's a key indicator that their main export markets are actually um, going into recession. So, you know, this is um, you know the Chinese problem, if you like, is really reflecting our problems. Now, whether that actually goes through to China, um, you know, falling apart, which a lot of Western commentators suggest is the case, I would say that um, I would say that they will allow bankruptcies in China. I don't think that HSBC is going to be among them, because, again, uh, that's such a major bank. Um, I can see that, you know, the central banks um, will come together, G20 sort of rescue type situation to stop banks like that failing. So I'm not worried about that too much. Um, I think perhaps we ought to be worrying more about, uh, you know, what's actually happening in China and how that might affect the global banking system and look at it that way around, if you like, rather than, um, I mean, one of the, one of the things which I noticed a long time ago was that there was, um, if you looked at um, HSBC USA, as it were, <clears throat> that looked like it wasn't uh, properly capitalized and all the rest of it. But actually, um, you know, the capital, if you like, is really it's it's it, it's the support of its parent, which uh, which is in there. So um, <clears throat> I don't think it's quite fair to look at it as um, as a risky bank in that sense. Um, Deutsche Bank, I followed Deutsche Bank for a long time. Um, I used to deal with them as a stockbroker uh, and uh, they are certainly a very, very powerful institution. Like uh, several of the um, main German private banks, that's a private bank, by the way, um, they are highly leveraged. I think they're becoming less leveraged. There is an issue over um, uh, their exposure to derivatives. Um, and derivatives is something which we ought to be thinking about, because um, when we look at what's going on in precious metals markets, we can see that at the very heart of derivatives, there is likely to be a problem because the establishment is short. While, you know, punters like you and I are long of gold, silver and uh, other central banks have basically cleaned out. Uh, Western capital markets and are still looking for stock. So um, if you like, the, the banking establishment, I think, has been caught, uh, you know, rather like Silicon Valley Bank. They haven't sort of, um, uh, you know, in a completely different context, they haven't sort of moved with the times and realized that there is something different going on here. And we do not need <clears throat> short positions, which we cannot control on our derivative books in gold and silver. And if you like, probably oil as well and probably copper. So um, that, I think, could lead to a problem in derivatives. And the reason I mention it is because banks like, uh, well, HSBC, but particularly Deutsche Bank in Europe, um, are very, very much involved with derivatives. And you're looking at derivatives which are, in terms of value, greater than the whole of the German economy. So, yeah, I mean, there is... The potential for enormous mess here, but as I um, as I said earlier, I'm convinced that um, the Fed and the central banks will do what they can to stop um, the muck hitting the fan, if I can put it that way, um, in, in in terms of banks. So we 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 will see. I mean, I think we're going in that direction where the test will happen. So um, 
And this is why I, I tell people, you know, if in doubt, get out of credit. Yeah. You know, in the wide sense. Yeah. Well, thank you for that excellent articulation summation, sir. Much appreciated. Which actually a good segue question, uh, Alistair, to that would be there's a lot of talk, as you know, of other countries uh, consistently across the board, as you know, dumping U.S. treasuries. But I saw a recent interview with Tom, Tom Lungo, where he was discussing the recent uh, treasury auctions. I believe he said those who have gone fairly well and that European community was buying a lot of that paper. It sort of surprised me. Did I, did I understand that correctly? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't followed it quite that closely. I just have a sense that um, the U.S. Treasury is funding um, is very, very heavily dependent on uh, the T-bill market for its funding. It's not really testing out along the yield curve, which makes sense because with um, Japan as sellers, China as sellers, those are the two largest holders of U.S. Treasuries. Um, there will always be demand, say, from pension funds. You'll get demand from insurance companies, and a lot of that comes via the Cayman Islands, for example. You will see it also coming via other financial centers, such as London and Luxembourg. Um, so in that sense, there is some demand for U.S. Treasuries, but it's sort of, if you like, a systemic demand rather than an investment demand. Um, I think if the, um, the U.S. Treasury uh, tried to fund out along the yield curve, You'd find that the yield curve would move positive really quite quickly, and indeed, as we as we speak, um, the uh, ten-year U.S. Treasury I see is yielding a bit over four percent now, having been down to three point what's three point six five something like that. So yields are tightening up, even though, um, as to your point earlier, we've had a fifty basis point cut, and we got the prospect of maybe two further cuts, another fifty basis points by the end of this year. So. Um, you know, these bond yields are rising and it's a question of supply and demand. And I think a lot of people forget that in debt markets, it is supply and demand. And indeed, in credit markets, it is supply and demand. And if the banks aren't prepared to lend, then what happens to rates? They go up. If bondholders are not prepared to buy, what happens? The rates go up. Um, now, the Fed can try and, um, if you like, uh, struggle against that. But if it does, it crucifies the currency. So it comes back to that problem. Almost, a almost like a double-edged sword in a way. Um, if you think about yeah. it, it's, they've got to deal with it. And it, everything you're pointing to, Alistair, once again, underscores your point earlier about a, a quickly and rapidly demising dollar, which is, you know, inflation is just nothing more than the dressed up tax. So um, that actually leads to my big question, Alistair. So I've got a few questions that kind of intersect each other. So if you will, if you would give me a little bit of rope here. Um, the BRICS summit, as you know, is happening two weeks from today in Kazan and Russia, Putin led, of course. They've been planning this for quite a while, is a, no surprise to you, October 22nd to 24th. And it includes a ton of countries. I believe in total, it's 160 that are either on the list or buying to get on the list. We just had today, Sri Lanka and Cuba, as you know, apply to get in as, as recently as the next two weeks. Very interesting timing. Saudi Arabia is finishing up their process, but I'm involved in most of the group's activities. Probably, I would say, and very interesting to get your, your take on your purview on it, most one of the most important summer, summits we've had uh, in quite some time, possibly if ever, because it seems to be hinting at a very strong de-dollarization, especially when you take it against the backs of two weeks ago, the UN General Assembly, which typically, as you know, those are widely considered, at least here in America, I don't know about you in, in Europe, but those are considered typically more obligatory or mundane sort of exercises. But this year, you saw Prime Minister Sudani of Iraq come out and say that peace and prosperity was their number one goal, that you know sovereignty and getting their country back on the international stage, big buzzwords. They are de-dollarizing the dollar before the end of the year in the currency auctions. We know the real rates in the private sector ministry planning not in the Forex, a little bit of a prestidigitation there in terms of movement of the, the monies, as you know. Um, so I guess my question is a twofold question. Number one, was your interpretation of the UN, UN General Assembly that of ours, which is that a lot of these countries are kind of saying, you know, in an official capacity to the world, we're preparing to nationalize our countries in terms of sovereignty and, and prosperity with respect to their respective currencies. And do you think that um, in two weeks they're going to make a formal announcement or do you think they're just going to just de-dollarize quietly? Because they've already done a deal, I believe on August 12th, 
India did a large oil purchase with China using the petro yuan. So what's your take on all that? Yeah, I think the first thing we have to understand is that a lot of the countries which um, have expressed an interest in joining BRICS uh, um, owe money in dollars. Um, and uh, traditionally, they've been concerned about American action if they don't fall in line with American economic policy, um, <clears throat> if they show themselves to be rebelling against it. Um, too often, we've had situations where, um, as the Chinese put it, the Americans go in and pump and dump, you know, they, 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 they uh, get someone into debt, and then they, they raise the rates on them and, you know, and screw them. Uh, and uh, the other thing, of course, is regime change. So um, all these countries are walking a very, very delicate diplomatic tightrope. They're being very careful about what they're doing. So they can't just say, well, we're, we're going to join um, uh, the BRICS lot. And we're just going to go in and uh, we're going to get rid of the dollar. Uh, we're going to work towards that and so on. No, because that is too dangerous. But we now have a momentum, which is actually the result of sanctions against Russia. Um, there is now a momentum of countries who are moving away from the Russian sphere of influence, Russian hegemony, if you like, towards the attractions of um, particularly Chinese-led uh, 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 arrangement, association, because China has the surpluses, has the um, ability to invest, do joint ventures and all the rest of it. Whereas we've never actually done that. What we've done is we've tried to bribe people in order to stay on side. Um, so we've corrupted regimes. Now, speaking as someone who's born and brought up in Africa and therefore has followed African politics to a degree, um, I think Africa as a whole is actually evolving away from that sort of situation. And, um, you know, in my well, ex-country, as it were, um, you know, the Chinese are building a, um, a new railway uh, from the coast, not stopping at Kampala, which is where the uh, the lunatic express which we built <laughs> stops but actually going on into the congo so uh you know this is i you know there's no doubt about it that this is going to facilitate the export of uh, all bodies of all sorts of things you know from uh, you know cobalt and copper and i mean you know everything absolutely everything so um but this is this is uh, you know while uh, you know the the ordinary African I, I think there is a cultural problem if you like on the ground, but as far as the politicians are concerned, this is the way they're going to get the communications into their country to propel it into an industrial revolution, such as we had in the nineteenth century, mm. and that is really what it's all about. So um, you know, you've been frightened of getting away from America because you might get punished for doing that. But now you've got the attraction of uh, the development of your country in a really positive way. And dare you be left out of that? So you can see how this is sort of swinging. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm sorry to say, but I think it's US foreign policy, which has actually mainly driven this. Um, you know, they've, they've they got wrong footed on the whole issue. And uh, consequently, uh, I can see this drift continuing. Now, um, you mentioned the meeting in Kazan in a couple of weeks time. Um, this is extremely important. It certainly is. Yeah. So, um, you know, this this meeting in Kazan is is very, very important. And uh, it's actually a subject which I'm writing about for my th Thursday article. And this mm. Thursday article I'm looking at you know, the, if you like, the geopolitics behind it, but also the vexed question of doing away with the dollar, uh, which is really the topic which I think you're really interested in. Very. Uh, the, the problem with doing it away, doing away with the dollar is that, um, you know, various people have come up with sort of different schemes and all the rest of it, a new trade settlement currency. But when you actually look at these schemes, um, there are two things about it which are, are completely wrong. The first is they're trying to embody uh, things like blockchains and digital, you know, central bank digital currencies and all the rest of it. That's the first thing, which is completely unnecessary and 
confusing. You know, it's, that's actually not going to cut any ice at all and isn't actually to the point. And the second thing is that it's quite clear that the people who put together these sort of schemes have no idea about um, uh, the accounting of banks and the creation of bank credit. They really just do not understand the relationship between money, which is legally gold and to a lesser extent silver and copper, and credit. Now, what is interesting is that um, Russia has struggled very, very hard to try and get something together. Um, it tried to get a, a new gold backed, and I put that very much, very loosely in inverted commas, currency on the agenda in Johannesburg last year uh, and failed to do it. And it was opposed, um, I think, very strongly by, by India, who again has, has this problem. I mean, you know, they've got business in the West and business in the East and all the rest of it, and uh, a very, very heavy um, Western influence. I mean, the Bank of England, if you like, um, is is uh, consulted on the appointment of the um, governor of the Reserve Bank of India. You know, those old ties are still there, amazingly. So um, India had a problem with this. And China, as far as China was concerned, um, you know, she was looking at this and thinking, well, if we have a gold-backed um, currency, then this is going to uh, be bad for the dollar, bad for uh, Western currencies, and um, is going to threaten our export markets. Upon which, you know, in other words, China was 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 signaling we're not ready for it, if if you like. So, but we're one year on, and um, uh, Russia has worked very very hard with something like two hundred meetings, um, seminars, whatever, um, you know, all aimed at um, you know Brexit nations, nations joining Brexit, Brexit. Uh, nations on the list, um, I mean, you know, something like, as you say, uh, something like 140 or so turn, you know, turned up, um, you know, particularly big things like the St. Petersburg uh, mm -hmm. uh, Economic Forum. Um, but the, you know, the actual list is probably a bit tighter. We're looking at about, you know, maybe 40 nations, but some of them very, very significant, you know, like, um, uh, you know, Malaya, Indonesia, which is a very um uh, you know, I mean, that's almost almost a G20. I think it is a G20 now. I think so. so, you know, so so th th there are some very very serious players in there, um, moving towards this grouping, as it were. Now, I think, I mean, there was a th th there's a journalist who um, I I follow. I mean, everything he writes, I read because um, he is so informative, and that's Pepe Escobar. Um, and uh, he wrote an article, I think it was on the 26th of September about China. And there was a throwaway paragraph down at the bottom of the article. And that is, it was something to the effect that um, they're now talking about a joint ruble, um, yuan, gold, um, new currency, BRICS currency. Now, this is very different because what we're no longer talking about is, um, you know, sort of having, if you like, the unit type proposal, which uh, was actually put up by a couple of fund managers. This is, it looked like it was an official document. It wasn't. It was actually two fund managers who, as I say, don't actually understand credit, bank credit in particular. Um, you know, the, 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 um, you know the, the the point about the way this currency is going is it's no longer sort of forty percent gold and the rest is a plethora of these currencies. What we're now looking at is um, gold, ruble, yuan. Now the ruble should go on the gold standard immediately. Mm -hmm. It would be of. I mean, bear, bear in mind that their current interest rates, um, the Reserve Bank's rate is eighteen percent. You know, um, and who would buy the ruble? No one, nobody would buy the ruble. So you can see that the ruble has got problems, but put it on, you know, put it on a proper gold standard, then it's a different thing. Then what you will see is you will see the Russian banks going out and lifting gold out of Western markets where the lease rate is 2%, passing it over to the, to, uh, the Russian central bank where they get 18%. Now the point is 18% in a gold substitute, as good as gold. This is the whole point. So, you know, that's what really that's the role of an interest rate, not to try and manage the economy, but to manage the gold reserves. 
And once you get that message on board, you can see how Russia immediately would benefit because what you would then get is you would then get a, a fall in the interest rates because that 16% margin between the lease rate in the West and 18%, you know, it's just crazy, crazy. I mean, right. gold would be flooding in. So they would reduce the rates. I think you'd find the rates would get down very, very quickly to something like five or 6% with price stability because the ruble is then tied to gold. And this is the key thing. It's no longer a fiat currency. So, um, and and uh, Sergei Glaziev has actually written about this, um, putting it almost in those terms. So, uh, you know, there are elements, if you like, at the top table in Russia that do actually understand the argument that I'm making. China has a problem. China knows that the end game for the, for the, for the dollar and for the Western financial system is its collapse. It has been buying gold ever since the People's Bank was appointed with that uh, in mind back in 1983. And I've got the legislation uh, translated in English. Um, so it's all there. We know that. Now, since then, they were buying gold in a bear market. They have accumulated a lot of gold. My calculations looking at uh, credit flows into and out of China. First of all, investment flows into China from the 80s onwards, and then gradually increasing into um, uh, exports from the late 90s onwards. Um, looking at all those flows by 2002, uh, I reckon that China had accumulated over 20,000 tons secretly, hidden around various government accounts. Now, um, 2002 was when the Shanghai uh, uh, Gold Exchange was opened and the Chinese citizens were then allowed to buy gold. Bear in mind also that China has encouraged gold mining. She very rapidly became the largest miner by output, gold miner by output, um, and is still the largest miner. Russia is now doing the same thing and uh, is close second, if you like, uh, with, with Australia. But you can see that, that going back, the Chinese knew that this was going to happen at some stage in the future and they needed to protect themselves by having sufficient gold to protect their currency. So they're, they're of the mindset for uh, putting the yuan onto a gold standard. The question is when. Now, if you look at the situation with the dollar, with the refusal and I don't care post-election that, you know, that um, whether Harris or, or, or Trump is going to sort of change the story and say, we've got to cut our spending. I don't think that's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is that you're going to look at higher deficits. You have got uh, your um, uh, uh, the debt limit being refixed on the 3rd. That's got to be agreed on the 3rd of January. Um, I mean, if I was Trump, if I was Harris, I'd probably say, well, at the moment, we're looking at 35 and a half trillion. How about 40? Why don't we make it 40? That will give me room to do what I want to do. I think that's the way that game is going to go. So coming back to China, China's looking at this. It's also looking at the wars. Um, uh, you know, you've got the Ukraine situation, which I think is probably coming under some sort of control uh, with Russia actually winning that one. Absolutely. Um, but now we've got a, um, a horrendous situation in the Middle East uh, with Israel. And there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that um, America is very much more involved than she appears to be. I mean, the, the bombing of, of Beirut was with American bombs. Um, you know, these bunker busted uh, bombs, you know, something like 86 of them dropped in the first two or three days. Um, mm -hmm. I think the the locations, if you like, of um, uh, Hezbollah's uh, headquarters and where uh, Nasrallah were, and the rest of it were, from what I understand, that was supplied by American intelligence. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, Israel's been using uh, AWACS, if you like, in guiding its missiles and all the rest of it. So, um, <clears throat> you know, America, I think, is actually um, very much... Uh, in, involved with with running the strategy on this one um and uh, mm. you know at the moment it's it's sort of getting mm. really rather tricky because if they attack iran iran has said that we will attack um the american bases in the region and we will also attack the oil refineries in the region you know and and not only that i don't think they actually need to do that 
um, I think that's a, 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 you know, people like a paper threat, because <clears throat> uh, with their control of the Straits of Hormuz, they will just make shipping oil out of the Gulf completely uninsurable. So, you know, whichever way, the escalation is going to push up the price of oil um, in dollars. And, um, you know, I think gold will go with it. Why? Because over the very, very long term, um, the price of oil in gold is sort of doesn't change too much. Uh, so, you know, this is this is the situation which, as far as China is concerned, is coming to a head a lot more rapidly than she would like to think. So she has a defensive reason to protect her yuan by putting it on a gold standard. And I think the way it will work with BRICS, because you won't get, I don't think you will get um, unanimity, if you like, on this uh, in, in, you know, in the BRICS uh, summit. I think what Russia and China will do, and particularly Russia, is they will say, this is our new gold-backed currency, um, and it means effectively putting the ruble and the yuan onto gold standards. If you want to use it, fine. If you don't want to use it, it's there for you. So, you know, this is not something that will be compulsory, I think. Uh, and I think that's the way they'll, they'll, they'll put it through. So we'll see in a couple of weeks' time. I mean, it's a pretty dramatic uh, statement to say that uh, this is now likely to happen. Uh, but in a sense, we have to wish it um, that it does happen because um, our fiat currency system is really um, on the point of failing. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we need we need someone in the world to continue to do business. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So if it's OK with you, Alistair, I'd like to comment on a lot of what you just unpacked there, because you actually answered two of the questions I was going to ask you as follow up. So I guess we should delve into the the sub stack of the details, if you like. But, um, you know, as you're as you are aware, I'm doing this for my audiences for posterity as well as yourself. But, you know, BRICS, it's, it, they're making it very attractive, as you said, for all those nations, as well as the whole of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, because they have roughly 40% gold, 30% Russian and 30% Chinese bonds, which is ostensibly gold instruments. So you, you bring that all together, that makes all those things we believe highly attractive. And then, uh, you know, it has that as an offering to the respective nations that want to obviously onboard at a precipitous rate. So I'm really glad you said that. Uh, I'm, it warmed my heart to hear you say about Africa because that's a nation, or I should say a continent or a country to be precise within that respective continent that our audience is very particular on is Zimbabwe. We feel very strongly that's a country that's not very promising, most amount of gold in the world. China, to your point, has, I think back in August has invested $300 million in mining to get the metal. So obviously they're very aware that they're a nutrient rich country. You can put a shovel into the ground and find gold everywhere and diamonds and lush tropical, you know, crop climate, you know, not unlike, yeah. you know, California and many other places in the world. So we're very, very keen on, on Zimbabwe. They, they're zig backing with a gold coin and the dollars and there's other things to follow. So that's a very uh, attractive prospect, we believe, in the not too distant future. Uh, I was glad that you brought up the geopolitical side with respect to the upcoming election, because I don't know what you're getting over there in Europe, but I'm sure it's widely skewed versus what we get here and vice versa. Here in America, um, our media is heavily manipulated and uh, certainly people in our camp don't uh, discount deeply whatever they say, as I'm sure you would, we're very contrarian here as you haven't, if you haven't ascertained. So we tend to go against the grain and do the opposite of what the construct of the deep state says. So I wasn't sad to hear you talk about the dollar declining because you know we are of the wide consensus, and I think you are as well, that, that the rest of the world is moving away and we need to do likewise, backing up in the real constitutional money, as you said, gold and silver. But it's our con uh, contention that President Trump is going to win. His poll numbers continue to surge despite, again, what the highly manipulated media might suggest again here, and I would imagine over there, um, he's rather well respected by our people as, as a whole. Uh, so we try not to get into to politics, but I think in this issue, it's highly unavoidable. And then you brought up something I was going to ask you about with respect to Israel, uh, because we do believe they're going to hit the power plants of Iran, or at least look like that. Uh, that'll be the, the narrative. And the oil reserves 
We talked about Strait of Hormuz, absolutely. So we believe in addition to gold and silver, you're going to see a precipitous spike in oil. We've been waiting for it for quite some time. So since you brought that up, um, what do you think, where do you think the price of oil will settle in the next three to 12 months as a result of that event? <laughs> I haven't a clue. I really haven't. I mean, all I can say is that this is, this is an increasing danger. Um, uh, there, there are two things. I mean, there's that. And there's the other thing. What's the purchasing power of the dollar going to be? I mean, you know, people don't look at that because they account in dollars. Um, and so, you know, their accounts show that, uh, you know, their portfolio might have gone up or gone down or whatever measured in dollars. But actually, um, that begs the question, what is the dollar actually buying? And, uh, you know, I think you will, you know, this is you've got to sort of stand in your head and realize that, you um, uh, you know, the dollar has so much subjectivity in uh, its value measured, um, you know, in, in commodities, goods and services, um, that it's really virtually impossible to give a forecast, if you like. Um, yeah. I think, I, I mean, there, there, there is, there is, I think, um, you know, a, a distinct likelihood, as you, as you say, that as uh, the Iranian situation, um, you know, if Iran is attacked, um, then I think we could see a big spike in uh, in the price of oil. I mean, we've already gone up from what sixty seven or sixty six, seventy something like that, mm -hmm. up to a high of about seventy six yeah. um, over the space of what a couple of weeks. Um, it has backed off a bit today. The whole of the commodity uh, complex. I mean, this is Tuesday the eighth. The whole of the commodity complex is actually you know, sunk back. Sorry, Tuesday the 9th, <laughs> one day out. So, um, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where it goes. You, I mean, you know, people say, well, it could go to two or $300. Um, hmm. I, I mean, the only thing I would say is that in the past, when you've had these crises, it's got as far as about $140. So I think rather than go for um, you know, sort of two or three hundred dollars. I would say that it would certainly spike up, in my view, above a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that would be um, catastrophic for uh, Western economies, which uh, at the moment uh, seem to be on the verge of recession. And I would argue that without government spending, the GDP numbers would actually be falling. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. I, we believe it's going to be somewhere between one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty. Uh, and then if it just precipitates, but mm. yeah, I, I mean, you have uh, Prime Minister Ben who came out on 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 a widely recognized network like him or 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 load them CNN and came out and said, you know, very directly that they are going to attack the oil fields and power plants of Iran, and this has been in different circles foretold from a faith standpoint for for quite some time. But now you're seeing it come into the whole of reality and society, you know, full spectrum right now. So. Uh, very exciting time for those of us who are, are certainly uh, prepared and keeping our eyes open, which is certainly our audience and obviously yours respectively. So, uh, uh, Alistair, I'll give you the last words. What, what, what are parting thoughts you'd like to give to the audience today and where can people find your work? <laughs> I've distilled it down to a mantra, get out of credit. <laughs> and actually, um, you, you know, to understand what credit is, um, it's also equities. Equities are credit because, I mm. mean, the definition of credit basically is you have got, um, you, you know, you have got a, a credit on one side and you've got a debt on the other side or an obligation, if you like, on the other side. Mm. And the obligation that, a, that company management has towards its shareholders is to deliver an income stream. So you have bought shares on the promise that that will be delivered. Um, so, you know, that is credit as well. Uh, and um, I can see that um, as soon as the value of credit starts contracting, um, collapsing, maybe it's um, you know that could be more dramatic, the more dramatic version. Then uh, all forms of credit, I think, are going to going to suffer. Apart from anything else, I mean, the, you know, if you start getting a falling dollar, it doesn't matter what the Fed says; interest rates will go higher. <laughs> You know, or nobody will be able to borrow anything. So you can see that th th there is that that um, problem re really mounting. So get out of credit is really um, what what I would say. Um, and um, 
uh, you know, I'd hope that some of um, uh, uh, your uh, viewers um, might consider going onto my Substack because uh, I try and write, um, you know, a sort of, if you like, a, a geopolitical or an economic um, or an article about, um, you know, sort of prices generally uh, once a week. That comes out on a Thursday. And then I do a, a market report on Friday. And then sometimes over the weekend, but I don't guarantee this, um, I'll look at the commitment of traders figures. And if there's something worth noting in that, then I will give that. So um, if you become a paid up member of my um, Substack, McLeod, Alistair McLeod dot Substack dot com, um, or come, you know, come and be a non paying member and, and, and get a flavor of it. Um, I I, I'm a great believer in trying to educate members of the public at this stage before um, they really do start suffering from a falling uh, purchasing power of their currency. I mean, the earlier the better that you begin to really understand what's happening. That is my mission to try and get that message over. Love it. Absolutely support you on that. And folks, as you know, uh, we're big proponents of gold and silver, other precious metals. So if you are looking to get precious metals, or if you're looking to get Dinar Dong, Zim, and other currencies that will be in the BRICS family, we will leave those links respectively in the description. Alistair McLeod, thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, we appreciate your time. We'll look forward to having you back in the near future. Thank you for having me, John. Thank you, sir. Take care.